Boy, it's just so much in life to worry about. We worry about our money, we worry about our health, we worry about our relationships, we worry about our jobs, we worry about our careers. And so in my moments with you today, by the time we are finished, you won't have to worry anymore. I don't care what it's about. I don't care what is provoking it, what is irritating, exacerbating, frustrating. We want to lift the burden based on God's word of worry. Three times we're commanded in this passage not to worry. Verse 25 says, for this reason I say to you, do not worry. Verse 31 says, do not worry then. Verse 34 says, so do not worry. Three times there is a command not to worry. Therefore, to worry is sin. If something is a command and you disobey it, it's called sin. Most people do not look as worry as sin. They look at it as natural. Look at it as something that is legit given the circumstances that I am facing. Yet the Lord in this passage gives a command and he couples the command with this statement. O oh, ye of little faith. You believe I can take you to heaven, you just don't believe I can cover you on earth. You believe I'm good for eternity, but I'm insufficient for time. Do not worry. The word worry, anxiety, means to be torn in two. Worry is concern on steroids. Worry is concern that's gone haywire. There is a difference between concern and worry. Concern is, I have an issue in my life that is troubling me and I am setting forth a plan as best I can to address it. That is legitimate concern. But worry is where the concern controls you. It is where because of the concern, I can't sleep. Because of the concern, I can't control my temper. Because of the concern, I am losing my ability to cope. It is where concern has now become the controlling factor because of the issue, whatever it is that you face. Now, let me give a clarification here. I am not talking about uh, chemical imbalance where there is a physical chemical reality that needs to be addressed because that physical is affecting that emotional and absolutely that may need medication. That is not to what I am addressing. What I am addressing is where the circumstance in and of itself is controlling you. It is dictating who you are, where you are, how you function, whether you function. It tells you if you can get up in the morning and tells you you better go to bed right now. It owns you. Well, he says in introducing this section, for this reason, and then he tells you don't worry. For this reason. So before he tells you don't worry, he says there's a reason. So you can't understand not to worry unless you understand the reason. So he says for this reason, which means we have to back up a few verses. And in verse 22, this is what he says. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness... How great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, because one of the big worries of life has to do with resources. He says, if you want to get over worry, you got to get rid of one of your masters. Worry will track you down 
if you've got more than one master. He says, if you've got God over here and something else in control over there, since the definition of worry is to be torn in two, and you've got two different masters going in two different directions, then they will keep you worried because you, they will keep you torn. He says the light is in the eye. If the light is in the eye, then the whole body knows what to grab, where to walk. The whole body can function because it's seeing things clearly. But if the eyes are dark, everything else is in trouble. The hands are in trouble. It doesn't know what it's grabbing. The feet are in trouble. It doesn't know where it's going. It says everything else is in trouble if there's darkness in the eye. If there is not clear sight because you have become divided with masters. One of the reasons why we stay worried is we stay divided between masters. He says you cannot serve two masters and when you do you will be worried because you will be divided the spiritual division creates or supports the ongoing nature of worry if you are divided double minded if you are distracted in terms of having master and a master is somebody who tells you what to do. A master is somebody who controls the priorities of life. He says, do not worry. O ye of little faith. He now says, he goes a little deeper. He says, if you are consumed by worry, if worry is your middle name, if you weren't worrying, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. He says, you don't understand God. You don't understand his nature and you don't understand his providence. And you don't understand his priorities. Notice what he says in verse 25. He says, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or as to your body, as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and body more than raiment. He says, folk get worried about the wrong thing. You get worried about what you are going to eat. You ought to be worried about whether you're going to get up to eat anything. Because life is more than food. You worried about food, but you are alive. Because if you don't have life, you don't have to worry about food. So if you have life, you can assume food. He says the body is more than raiment. The body is more than clothes. We worry about old clothes, new clothes, torn clothes, sewed up clothes. We worry about clothes. He says you worried about the wrong thing. You need to worry about whether your body is in intact to put your arms through those sleeves. Messed up priorities. He says, he says in verse 26, have you ever paid attention to nature? He says, have you ever, have, have you ever, have you ever studied nature? Because he says in verse 26, look at the birds. Look at the birds. Because he says they don't sow nor reap or gather in the bonds and your heavenly father feeds them. Not their heavenly father, your heavenly father. Aren't you not worth, worth much more than they? They assume there will be a worm somewhere today with their name on it. They assume that. So they get up singing. We get up fussing, cussing, and complaining. The birds, he says, have you not looked at the birds? Are you not worth much more than they? He says, clothing. He says, Solomon was not arrayed like the lilies of the field. The, the, the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. You, you've never seen a, a lily using a sewing machine, calling on singer to keep my pedal on. 
See, you, you don't see that. He says, because God works it out in nature. See, the thing is, we don't know who we're dealing with. And so we find ourselves under the stranglehold of worry. And yet he says, don't do it. It's a sin. And when you do it, you elevate the natural over the supernatural. Man over God. And you're telling me you are your God. And you live divided and torn. So it shouldn't surprise us that Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. It shouldn't surprise us that 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 6 to 8 says God gives peace in every circumstance. Now don't, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that life does not get hard. I am not suggesting that. We all know better than that. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. But then he's going to bounce right off of that and say, be of good cheer. <laughs> say, what? You just told me I'm going, I can expect trouble and then you're going to tell me, cheer up and sing. When we understand, when God allows trouble in our lives, I'm not talking about trouble we create now. I'm talking about trouble that he allows that would create the insecurity that drives us from concern to worry. That what he is creating in your situation is an opportunity to see that he's God. Okay, okay. So the next time you are tempted to worry beyond concern, concern is where you have a real issue and you are seeking a way to resolve it. Worry is where it has taken over the concern and it is a controlling you. The next time you are tempted to worry, you must now look at that as an opportunity for God to let you see how much God he is. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, God gave us a great ordeal of affliction. So we were down to the point where we didn't even know whether we were going to live. It got that bad. But then he adds a phrase, and he did it so that we could see he is the one who raises the dead. He did it so he can let us see he's God. When worry is seeping in. That is a call to faith in the midst of the legitimacy of the concern. So what do you do? What do you do? Verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay, this is a little embarrassing because what he says is, when you worry, you have now joined the ranks of pagans. The Gentiles, the non-believers, the pagans, he says, they break their necks, mismanage their priorities, because they got to make it happen themselves. They seek, they seek to control it. Why? Because they are their own gods. But you got a daddy. Your heavenly father. God gets insulted when we question his capacity, his ability, and his intentionality to cover the needs of his people. Now, I'm not talking about every want. I'm not talking about every desire. He's talking about he knows you need these things. He's talking about the needs of life. He says, stop being pagans because he says, I'm talking about your daddy. But your daddy has also got to be your master. 
I love Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 because he says God will keep you from worrying in a drought. A drought is when there is no rain, so there is no growth. A drought is when the work stops, when the pink slips are being handed out. He says he will keep you from worrying in a drought. He says, no, your daddy knows where you are, how you got there, and what you need. He knows how to arrange things, rearrange things, flip things, twit things, trip things. He knows how to do it. He says, stop acting like the heathen. So what do you all have to do? Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. The key word is first. All that. No. You seek you first the kingdom. The kingdom is divine rule. That I'm in charge here. Righteousness is divine standard. That you're living to please me based on the standards as revealed in my word. So my rule, my standard, that's first. Now you got my attention. And one of the reasons why we're not seeing more of God is he's somewhere down the line. When we get to him. Seek ye first. Primacy, priority. The rule and the standards of God as your priority. And then he closes with this zinger. And it is a zinger because it's, it's so hard to do. He says in verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, yeah, God, you can say all that. You God. Okay. We are troubled by the problems of the past. We are troubled by the struggles of the present. And we are troubled by the uncertainty of the future. All those. And sometimes we trouble about all three at the same time. He says, I need to teach you, the Lord says, how to manage time. Most of us are crucified between two things, yesterday and tomorrow. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. You ever notice when you worried about Tomorrow, when you get to tomorrow, then you're worried about the next tomorrow. <laughs> he says, when it comes to living, you have to learn to do it one day at a time. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, his mercies are new every day. And let me put it this way. He's not going to give you tomorrow's mercy today. Today, he's going to give you for today. And, and you know, one of the worst phrases in the world is you worrying and somebody comes to you tell you stop worrying. Well, if I could do that, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? You need somebody who will take you higher so that you can see that when you have one master and one father and he's first... That worry does not have to be the controlling element in your life. Whenever you are tempted to worry, that is an automatic, immediate invitation to pray. On the spot, when worry shows up, you have then got a formal invitation in writing to pray. If you don't believe me, all you need to read is Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. This is not a prayer in the morning only. This is a prayer whenever worry shows up its ugly head. God has just said you and I need to have a conversation right now. Whenever the temptation is to worry, that is the invitation to Pray and guess what he says? And when you come to me, come with thanksgiving. Come with thanksgiving. I want you to give thanks. 
in the midst of your request. And then he says, and the God of peace will meet you in that space. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will meet you in that place. So here's what I want you to do. All of us, me, you, us. We need to change the place we put B-U-T. B-U-T. Because here's what we normally do. I trust God, but but you don't know what I'm going through, girl. I love the Lord, but I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. I know he's able, but but, you know, I'm going to throw in the towel. I know that's wrong. No, let's start. Let's try this again. There are only two verses in the Bible that mention his name. Chapter 3, verse 31 of Judges. Chapter 5, verse 6 of Judges. Yet, as we will discover, this man has a message for the men in this house today. For all of us, but especially for the men. We're told in chapter 5, verse 6, that during the days of Shemgar, nobody was traveling along the highways. They went in roundabout ways. The main highways had been deserted. And if men wanted to go somewhere, if people wanted to travel, they had to go roundabout ways. They had to go on the dirt roads. They had to go on the side roads. They, they couldn't go on the main thoroughfares. To understand why we're told that, you have to understand the book of Judges. You see, the book of Judges talks about God's people in a failed scenario. Judges 21 verse 25 says, that there was no king in those days and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So during the days of the judges, this was a time of what we would call the day postmodernism. No absolutes existed. Everybody had their own truth. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody dealt with situations based on how they felt about it. There was no governing standard that governed everybody, so people made up their own rules, leading to cultural chaos. So people individually became their own God, became their own king and did their own thing because they were their own Standard. There was no superintending governing guidance to which all the people subscribed. Enter the Philistines. The Philistines were the enemies of Israel. When they saw the chaos in the society, they took that as an invitation to take advantage of a disintegrating culture. Since the folk can't get along, since everybody else is making up their own rules, since there's chaos everywhere we look, we the Philistines are going to invade Israel. So you have an invasion occurring, that's why it talks about him slaying the Philistines, because you have chaos. Now, you don't need to read the Bible to see what that looks like. All you got to do is read the newspaper or look at the news and you will see today we are in a chaotic situation because people have made up their own rules about life, about sexuality, about race, about culture, about class. Nobody getting along with anybody and there's conflict in a person's own life, in our families fraying, in our communities divided over all of these issues. 
And so you get arguments back and forth and back and forth and marches about this and complaints about that. And there is chaos which always sets the stage for the enemy to invade the environment. So don't be surprised when things get worse when there is no standard. So that was the situation that brings us Shemgar. A chaotic situation of violence, of terrorism, of cultural collapse, of people defining themselves not by God, but by their own thinking, their own feelings, or their own information, opening the door for the Philistines to invade the land, which affected commerce because you could not do the main roads anymore. So any business that you needed to conduct, anybody you wanted to visit, you had to find a side way to get to them. You had to go roundabout because if you showed up on that major highway, the Philistines were going to get you. They had shut down mobility in the culture. So you've got major cultural collapse. In the midst of the crisis, we have 22 words. Judges chapter 3, verse 31, 22 words about a man named Shemgar. But these are 22 powerful, powerful words that gives each of us, but especially the men here, principles by which if you grab them, understand them, and inculcate them, how you can make a difference in spite of how bad things are. After him, that is, after the previous judge, Ehud, came, we're told, Shemgar. Now, the first thing I want you to note, first thing I want you to note about Shemgar is what he did before he became a judge. Because it says he slew 600 Philistines with an ox gourd. So that tells us what his job was before he became a, a judge over Israel. He's a farmer. Because an ox goad, an ox goad is an eight foot pole with a sharp metal tip on one end and a flat chisel area on the other end. The sharp end of the ox goad was used to goad the ox and keep them pulling the plow. So whenever they slowed down, you would prick it and prick it and prick it so it would pick back up for completing the farming responsibilities. The chisel on the back end, the flat surface of metal on the back end, was for the farmer to dig up roots and to dig up things that were obstructing the process of tilling the soil so that he could plant his seed. So this was a very important tool in the hand of a farmer. Farmers had ox goats. So we find out about Shemgar that he doesn't start off as a judge, he starts off as a farmer. Now why do you need to know that? You need to know that because the first thing you and I need to do is start where you are. You don't start where you want to be, you start where you are. A lot of folk are waiting till they get more money, more education, higher position, more notoriety before they do anything. There are many things in God's kingdom that do not get done because he's waiting on God's people to move with where they are right now. Shemgar, we find him on a farm. One of the great tragedies far too often in the life of men is procrastination. That's why the Bible says in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, serve the creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait till you get old. One of the things that far too many of us as men lack is vision. God specifically created men to express vision. 
When he created Adam, he says, Adam, here's the garden. Now I want you to take this raw material and I want you to cultivate it and I want you to develop it and I want you to turn it into something beyond what you started with. A lot of times men are asking their wives to follow a park bus or a park car because there has been no vision given for where God wants us to go. It is the responsibility of the man to set forth vision. The Bible says in uh, Joel chapter 2 verse 28, repeated again in Acts chapter 2 verse 17, it says, your sons shall have, your younger sons shall have vision and the old men will dream dreams. Doesn't bring the women into that. He says the women shall prophesy. But he says it will be the men who will have visions and it will be the older men who will dream dreams. So every man in here is supposed to be a vision caster and a dream maker. So it is the man's role to cast a vision. This is where we are. I don't like things as they are. So I'm going to seek God to give me a vision for what he wants to do to take it from where it is to where he wants it to be. Shemgar was dissatisfied. He's a farmer, but he sees that he can't travel down the main highway now. The main highways are blocked. The main highways are the caravans of Philistines are stopping me from getting my produce from my farm to farmer's market. It's stopping me from being able to go through the straight line down the highway because these, these evil people have taken over my neighborhood, my community, and now I got to find a, a roundabout way to go because those were the days. And it's all because there was no standard in the land. Inviting the enemy to take over. Shemgar is a farmer, but he's dissatisfied with the conditions. And so he takes an ox gourd. An ox gourd. Wait a minute. An ox gourd is for farming. That's what you do. You, you prod the animal along so he can keep pulling the plow. You dig up the roots and the, the brushes that are in the way. But because he's a man of vision, it dawns on him. I can use this ox goad, it's pronounced ox goad, I can use this ox goad for more than farming. I can use this ox goad to make this a better place to live, work, play, raise a family. I, I can use this tool that I thought was only for my economic prosperity. I can use this tool to do something more. God wants you to start right where you are, but guess what else he wants? He wants you to use what he's already given you. He's already had an ox goad. He's already got that right in his hand. He just never knew it could be used for more than farming. Until it dawns on him one day, and I'll tell you why it dawned on him in a few moments. It dawned on him one day, wait a minute. I already have what I need to do to get what God wants me to do done. See, a lot of folk are looking for new stuff when God has already given us the old stuff if we would ever learn to use it for his purposes. But because we've been so secularized in thinking, we use it for, you know, our growth, our income, our notoriety, our prestige, and, 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 and we forget that there is something bigger on the stage. It says that he slew 600 Philistine with the ox gold. Yeah. Now let's talk about the odds. That, that's 600 to 1 odds. Yeah. Uh, that's big odds. Now I know a lot of men in here have things against you, but it's probably not 600 to 1. Yeah. Yeah. This is 600 Philistines against one guy who only has one tool. He slew 600 Philistines with one ox gourd. Because... When you take what you have and God can get a hold of it right, you will be amazed at what he can do with it. He has one ox goat and this one ox goat gets rid of 600 problems. How many problems are in your life, in your world, in your job, on your career? How many problems are in your home, in your family? You say there are dozens and dozens of them. He had 600. 
He had one tool. But because he knew how to use the one tool the right way under divine influence, it was able to get the job done. If God could ever get a hold of the ox goad in your life, what he has handed you that he wants to use for something bigger than just your little small world because you're dissatisfied with the confusion, you're dissatisfied with the crime, you're dissatisfied with the chaos, you're dissatisfied with the terrorism. But now you want to take what God has given you, hand it back to him. All David had was a stone. That's all he had. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would taunt the armies of the living God? He just had a stone and a slingshot, but he also had one thing. He says, you come to me with all that equipment, Goliath. I come to you in the name of the Lord. So let's see what he does with this stone when I let it go. Holy Ghost took the stone, drew it into Goliath's head. He chopped off Goliath's head and said, hey, y'all. In other words, all he needed was what he had. It just had to get sanctified by God so that it could now do something bigger than it could ever do on its own. All Samson had was the jawbone of a donkey. A thousand Philistines came against him. He put himself in the crevice of the rock. And the Bible says when the Spirit of God came on him, he slew 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Why? Because it was no longer just the jawbone of a donkey. God had gotten a hold of that thing and he did something bigger with that than Samson could ever do on his own. All the little boy had was sardines and crackers, a couple of fish and some barley loaves, but Jesus turned it into a Moby Dick sandwich. But he only turned it into a Moby Dick sandwich when the little boy gave his sardines and crackers to Jesus Christ. And when he gave it to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ prayed over it and it did something bigger than what the boy could ever do on its own. What I'm trying to say to you is that if you will allow God as a man to give you a vision for what he wants to do with your life, he will blow your mind at how, as to how he can take a little and do a lot with it. So the question on the floor now is, how do you, how do you defeat 600 when it's only you? And all you have is an ox goad. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you do that? Uh -huh. You don't do it all at one time. If 600 come at you at one time, yeah. they had cut off all the roads, uh -huh. all the highways, yeah. which means they weren't all in one place at one time. Yeah. See, they're spread out among the different highways. Yeah. Yeah. So he had a bunch of gangs he had to deal with. Uh -huh. So he may have 25 here and 50 here, right? He looked at his ox goad and said, hmm, nah, this could be a tomahawk missile. <laughs> it's sharp on one side, yeah. flat on the other side, and I know how to use it because yeah. I've been farming with this thing for years. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, God is looking for somebody. He's searching for somebody who he can use to show himself strong through. God wants to show off. His problem is finding somebody. He's had problems finding somebody. And as we saw with other scriptures, especially finding a man. Because there's some things he only wants to do through a man. Not because women aren't critical, important, and strategic. But there are some things he wants to get men to do. First Chronicles 4, verse 9 and 10, we are familiar with the prayer of Jabez. The word Jabez means pain. One day, Jabez, expand my borders. Remove evil from me. He cries out to God to change his life. 
He said what many in our, men in our culture need to say today, and even in our, in our churches, I was made for more than this. I wasn't just made to be pain all of my life. I don't want to go out like that. I want to go out victorious. I want to go out. I want to go out with confidence. So he cried out to God. And the Bible says, and when he cried out to God, the Lord heard him and answered each one of his prayers. We can't get men to drop to their knees. We can't get men to submit to God. We can't get men to cultivate a relationship with God underneath the rule of God. What was Shemgar's secret? What was the key that shifted his life so that he became a judge and one man saved the whole nation? Says he saved Israel. One man with an ox goad. What was his secret? Well, you have to understand how you got to be a judge. Let me show you the first judge. Chapter 3, verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. There it is. You know how you became a judge? God took over. Sins in the Bible are used in a number of ways. First of all, there is the physical mountain that we normally use the word to refer to. But also in the Bible, mountain also refers to kingdoms. The kingdom of God is called a mountain. The kingdom of Satan is called a mountain. And the kingdom of men is called a mountain. It's referring to a rule over a sphere. The word mountain is used of that. The third way that the word mountain is used in the Bible, as it is used in this passage, is for an unovercomable situation. A situation that looms so large, you can't move it by yourself, and you don't even know anybody who can help you move it. It's just too big. You can't get over the hump. It's too awesome in its problematic impact on your life. It's a mountain. Those are called mountains. Zechariah 4.7 uses the word mountain in this way. Some obstacle that looms large in your life to which you need divine help to move. In this passage today, Jesus talks about moving mountains. And it is introduced by a fig tree. Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, verse 20, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday has withered today from the root up. You pronounced a curse yesterday. We came out here today and what you said yesterday not only has happened today, but it is super happened because it is withered not only with the fig part, but it is withered from the root up. So whatever you said has completely reversed this situation. We find in verse 12, Jesus is hungry and Jesus wants to get something to eat. He looks and he sees a fig tree in leaf. That is the leaves were out. When the leaves are out on a fig tree, that means they are figs. The leaves are the external validation that figs are on the tree. Jesus being hungry goes over to the fig tree in leaf to get figs. We're also told it was not the season for figs. So the tree is showing fig leaf when it's not even the season for figs to grow. So Jesus sees something out of the norm and goes over in his humanity because he's hungry. But when he goes over, he discovers there are leaves with no figs. There are leaves with no figs. Let me put it another way. There is an external reality with no internal reality. There is external show with no internal meaning. There is the look of figs without the reality of figs. The fig tree was a deception. It was trickery. 
because there were no figs. So Jesus curses the fig tree. He says, because you are a deceiving tree, I'm hungry. You gave me the visible impression you could feed me. When I came over, there was nothing but a good look, but no substance. And so I'm going to curse your external activity because of the absence of an internal reality. However, between the fig tree yesterday and the fig tree today, there is a story. Let's look at the story to tie the two days of the fig tree together. It says in verse 15, between the two fig tree events, Jesus comes to Jerusalem, enters the temple, he drives out those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach them saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Follow me now. On yesterday, Jesus was hungry and he went to a fig tree that looked like it was real, but when he got up close, there were no figs, there was no reality. The following day, he goes to church, the temple, and where he should have found folk worshiping God, where he should have found folk praying to God, where he should have found folk living for God. He found fake religion, not the real thing. Now, it was in the right building because it was in the temple. It had the right folk because there were the priest, but it didn't have spiritual reality. They were shucking and jiving in church. They were playing religion in church. They had the leaves, and the leaves should have meant you should find God here. You should find his presence here. You should find his power here. But when Jesus showed up, all they were doing were playing games in the house of the Lord. There was no reality to their religion. You see, religion without reality is leaf without life. Religion without reality is leaf without substance. You can look the part, but when we get up close and peer close, there is no spiritual life, spiritual reality. You see, between the fig tree yesterday and the fig tree today is the temple story. And in the temple story, which is Jesus' major point, is you're supposed to be reality, but all I see is Christian leaves. I don't see the spirit of God, the power of God, the presence of God. All you're doing is trying to make money. All you're doing is having programs. All you're doing is activity that has absolutely nothing to do with spiritual reality. You got fake church going on. In fact, he goes on to say, when he quotes the Old Testament, my house shall be known as a house of prayer. Jesus is delusioned by the church, by Christians who are satisfied with leaf Christianity and not life Christianity, who want leaves but who don't want figs. External religious look without internal religious reality. And so when he talks about that, it says, Peter says to him, Master, Rabbi, the tree has withered from the root up. I mean, you curse the tree, but in 24 hours, this whole tree is gone. How could you do this? Now, it's interesting. It says Jesus answered, but technically, Peter didn't ask a question. All Peter said was, the tree is withered from the root up. Well, that's not a question. That's a statement. But Jesus knew what he was getting at. What Peter was getting at is, how could something that big happen this fast? That, that's the question. Jesus knew what his question was. Tree is fine yesterday, you cursed it yesterday, it's gone today. How could all that happen in 24 hours? And that's when Jesus now gives him and gives you and me his secret for moving mountains. Things in your life that are too big for you to handle on your own and for anybody else you know 
to handle for you. He says in verse 22, have faith in God. He says a simple statement, have faith in God. You want to know how I got that tree from yesterday to be totally transformed today? Here's my answer, Peter and the disciples. Have faith in God. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, if you have the faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, uses the word mountain, be moved, and the mountain will be moved. He says, and this comes through fasting and prayer. He says, mustard seed faith can work if it's in the right object. Don't have faith in your faith have faith in the right object. A lot of faith in the wrong object will go nowhere. A little faith in the right object will go a long way. <laughs> to put faith in God means that you must put faith in God's word, God's will, and God's character. And when you have faith in that God, now we can discuss mountain moving prayers. If you don't have faith in that God, then you're asking the wrong person to move the mountain because you're not asking the person whom you are to truly have faith in. He then says you must put confidence in God, his will, his way, his word. What do you do next with your mountain? Here's what you do. He says, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea. So Jesus is probably on the Mount of Olives, 15 miles downhill is the Dead Sea. He says, if God is working for you, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will relocate itself. The problem is the mountain. You want to get the mountain off of you. You want it to relocate itself away from you. He says, if there's figs on your tree, there is life. You have faith in the true God. Then you can do with your mountain what you saw me do, Peter, with mine. I spoke to it. He talks about praying to God, but then he talks about speaking to your mountain. Prayer is when I talk this way. My mountain is what I'm experiencing out here in my daily life. He says, if there's figs on the tree, real life, you're not withering. If you have faith in the real God, not the God of your own making, his will, his word, and his character, then you can have a conversation with your problem because your mountain is your problem. And when you speak to your mountain, it says the mountain will relocate itself. It means get out of your face. The mountain will relocate itself. Now, now this raises a question. And the question is in what Jesus says after this. And it's a question in everybody's heart and mind. He says, all things with which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whatever, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you. In verse 24, he makes a staggering statement. Whatever you have asked for, believe you have received it. In other words, you haven't received it yet, but believe you have received it, even though you haven't received it. So you expect it, but you haven't received it. The difference between God's unconditional will and his conditional will. God's unconditional will is what he decides to do regardless of what anybody else does. In other words, he's going to do it, period. His sovereignty has decided this is what I'm going to do. And no matter what you do, don't do what somebody else does, they don't do. Nothing will change because this is my unconditional will. That is, it's not tied to any conditions. 
I'm just going to do it because I have my prerogative to do it. The reason why God tells us to pray is so that we can link into his conditional will because his unconditional will is going to happen whether we pray or not. But his conditional will only happens if we obey, if we pray, if we believe, and if we have figs on the tree. That is, we are, we are full of divine life operating within us. So that's condition. So many of the things that we pray for, we don't get because we didn't meet the conditions. It didn't feel, fit God's conditional will. Because if it's his unconditional will, it's going to happen regardless. But if it's his conditional will, it happens if. Only if certain factors are made. And that's why in the scriptures, we're told that we have to qualify for certain things to happen because it's tied to his conditional will. So, how do you know if something you're asking for is unconditional, he's going to do it or not do it anyway, or conditional? Let me answer that two ways. Number one, many times you don't know. Okay? Many times God is silent on whether it's unconditional or conditional. So guess what you do? You treat it like it's conditional. If you're not sure, then you treat it like it's conditional. And you do everything you're supposed to do so that if it is unconditional, you've met all the standards for God to fulfill his, if it is conditional, for God to fulfill his conditional will regarding that situation. But then there's another answer. First John chapter five, verses 14 and 15 says, and we have this confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that he will grant what we have requested. So here's another secret to God's conditional will. When God is operating on a conditional will and he wants you to qualify to move this mountain that you are facing, what he will do is give you an inbred confidence or a sense of assurance or a sense of peace or a sense of, of for realness that this thing is going to happen. Because when God is doing something big in your life, he has to do two things at the same time. Prepare the thing that he wants done and prepare you for the thing he's doing. Both things have to collide. If you are not being prepared, then you're not ready. You're like the children in the wilderness because you're not ready for the promised land because you won't meet the conditions. But he also has to get the promised land ready so that when you arrive there and he's ready to move the mountain, the mountain is already ready to obey. It's in the hands of Almighty God of whether it's conditional or unconditional. But what I don't want it to happen is I don't want it to be conditional and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. But then one more thing, and it's an important thing. He says, whoever, whenever you're standing praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so your Father in heaven will forgive you. Okay, watch this. Forgiveness is a condition of moving mountains. This is, this, is, this is in the same story. Forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. You can forgive without being reconciled. For example, suppose the person you need to forgive has died. You can't reconcile with them. Suppose the person you need to forgive, you don't even know where they are anymore. You can't reconcile with them. Or suppose the person you need to forgive doesn't want to repent, doesn't want to say I'm sorry, doesn't want to confess, then you can't reconcile with them. Forgiveness can lead to reconciliation, but forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Forgiveness is where you are not seeking revenge against the offender, okay? I am not seeking vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. You are not seeking to repay. What God is saying is, you're blocking me moving your mountain. Because what you're wanting from me is my forgiveness for you. Well, if you want my forgiveness for you, you've got to be willing to offer it to somebody else. Now, unless you have the right view of God, you're not going to do that. Because you think, I'm going to repay this. 
I'm going to get my posse to repay this because because that you shouldn't have done that to me and and and, and I'm going to get you for doing that. Well, what you just did, you didn't have faith in the God of the Bible. So you got to have faith in the God of the Bible, which keeps you from needing vengeance for yourself, not necessarily reconciliation, but vengeance for yourself. See, the reason why Joseph, Joseph could forgive his brothers for selling them into slavery, putting them in a hole, selling them to the Ishmaelites, he says, he forgive, he say, I forgive you. And the reason I can forgive you is you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God is so big. He used your mess to create my miracle. That's a, unless you have that view of God, you will do the wrong thing because you don't have faith in God. And you'll do the wrong thing while talking about God. Yeah, I'm trusting the Lord while I get them back. Okay? So you'll do the wrong thing in the name of God. I'm trying to create for me, for you, for us, this bigger view of God, that we have faith in that God, that we are life Christians, not leaf Christians. We don't just come to church on Sunday. We want to make this house a house of prayer, not just a house of preaching. A house where we cry out to God and where we see miracles happen here. I want people to come not for the preacher or the sermon, but because of the power that's happening. Lives are changed. Miracles are taking place. Sicknesses are healed. Marriages are restored. Sins are overcome. Addictions are, are canceled. That's why they come. And then if they come for that, the preaching becomes extra because they're coming for the power of God in this house. That's what we're crying for. And so if you meet the qualifications, you want to be an authentic life Christian. You want to cry out to God in prayer and in faith. You're going to speak to the mountain and you're going to forgive those who need to be forgiven. Whether that's writing a letter, sending a note, making a call if those people are contactable or just acknowledging to God if they aren't, I release them. Lord, I don't feel like releasing them. I don't even want to release them, but I do know I want my mountain move. So because I want my mountain move in the name of Jesus Christ, I release them from their offense against me. I'm going to let you handle them because I need you to move this mountain in my life. And when we qualify for the mountain moving work of God, we will see mountains move. Things that God once moved. We'll see them moved. And we will see God's power in this house. And that's what I want. We've got a mountain. You have mountains. And if you don't have one, keep living. You're going to have a mountain. Something too big for you to move. Just make sure that when you face your mountain, you have qualified for the conditional will of God to see that mountain move. In closing, there was a husband who went to the doctor on behalf of his wife. He says, Doc, my wife have a, has a hearing problem. She can't hear well. I can be talking to her, screaming across the room, and she doesn't hear. The doctor said, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Let's set an appointment. You bring her in next week. But between now and next week, I want you to run a test. I said, Doc, what's the test? He said, stand 15 feet away, and when she's cooking, ask her what she's cooking. If she doesn't answer, then go 10 feet away and ask her what she's cooking. If she doesn't answer, go 5 feet away and ask her what she's cooking. If she still doesn't answer, go right up to her ear and shout in her ear, what are you cooking? to see whether she answers then, because that'll give me a measurement of how many feet it takes before she's hearing. He says, okay, I'll do it. He went home 15 feet away. Dear, what are you cooking? Nothing. He goes 10 feet away. Dear, what are you cooking? Nothing. He goes five feet away. Dear, what are you cooking? Nothing. Goes right up to her ear. Dear, what are you cooking? She says, for the fourth time, vegetable stew.
The evil one has stood at the door of your life and my life. And he has one overriding purpose, and that is to block God's purpose for you. He wants to stop God's preordained design for your life from you ever experiencing it, or if you do experience it, it will be through much trial and turmoil and difficulty. He stands at the door of your existence to make sure that what has been written in your book is not experienced. As part of his design, he wants you to have sicknesses that were outside of God's will. He wants you to have discouragement that is outside of God's will. He wants you to have pain and relational breakdown that is outside of God's will. And if he gets his full way, he wants to take you to an early grave. Because his goal is to deny you what's written in your book. Now, in previous sermons, we've looked at the fact that every Christian has a book. A book that has outlined God's kingdom purpose for your life. It has been recorded. He wants to block entrance to that experience. Now, do not misunderstand me. Every sickness, every disappointment, every difficulty, and every death is not outside of God's will. But some sicknesses, some disappointments, some struggles, and some deaths are outside of his will. That is, outside of his desired will because they've been interfered with by Satan's ability to block God's purposes. But the good news today is that you can silence the accuser. To whatever degree he is bringing havoc into your life, God has come up with a legislative mechanism, a legal right, that you have in order to keep him from robbing you of God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. We find in the book of Revelation this statement about a war in heaven. This goes back to our original concept of the angelic conflicts that the battle of angels up there affect us down here. We see that Satan is removed in the tribulation. Let me perhaps give an explanation. Satan, when Adam fell, was kicked out of heaven to earth, but he still had access to heaven. In the book of Revelation, he loses access to heaven. But now he still has access. In fact, next week, we're actually going to go into a courtroom and see how a trial plays out. And you going to be on the witness stand. Because there there's an actual trial taking place in scripture that will take us deeper than time will allow us to go today. So it's time for you to go to court. But let's look at the principle. There is this spiritual battle and we're told who he is, the dragon, verse 9, who's called the devil, who's called Satan. He's the adversary. And his job is to keep you from experiencing what God has done. And he tells you his methodology, who deceives, verse 9, the whole world. If you hear, you in the world. If you're here, that means you're subject to deception. You and I are living in a day of mass deception. God has written a book. He's laid it out. This is my kingdom purpose for you that you are to work out. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, that we might work out, it says, his will or his purpose. So you were created for God's purpose, you were redeemed for God's purpose, and everything is to be designed because Psalm 40, verse 7 and 8, there is a book. And that book is to fulfill his will. So, Satan's job is to block that will 
from entering into the university of your life, becoming your experience. When he tricks you, me, us, individually in our families, with our mates, with our children, with our co-workers, with fellow saints, when he can manipulate and twist you, then he accuses you of what he tricked you into. He is the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses them before our God day and night. This is a legal term. Accusing is a legal term. It has to do with a complainant in a lawsuit. Because Satan seeks to defeat us legally. To accuse is to be a complainant in a lawsuit. And he does it for the whole world. For non-Christians, he wants them to keep them from becoming Christians. For Christians, he wants them to keep them from fulfilling God's plan for their lives during their time on earth. But we hear in verse, verse 11, and they overcame him. Now, in order to be an overcomer, you got to have something to overcome. And in this case, you're overcoming a suit by Satan against you. He goes to the court of heaven and he says, you can't do this for this person or that person. Do that because look at the crimes they have committed. Even though I'm the one who tricked them to commit it, look at the crimes that they have committed, which is against your righteous standard. So your purpose cannot be filled without you compromising your righteousness. Because Satan knows more about God than many of his children do. That God's standards are the governance by which he makes decisions. It's his laws, his rules. So the accuser comes in order to block God's plan, God's progress through legal accusation in the presence of God, but they overcame him. To overcome is to prevail against one's adversary opposition or circumstances. It is to prevail against or over or through. So what I want to tell you is how you overcome. How you silence the accuser in the courtroom of heaven. He lists three things. And they overcame him, number one, because of the blood of the lamb. So let me talk about the blood. Since that's the first thing that silences Satan when he's accusing you by name in court. The first thing you need to know is the blood talks. We talking about speaking blood. If you don't believe me, look at chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 24, where we ended last time of the book of Hebrews, because you need to understand what this blood is doing. That is what the sacrifice of Christ is currently accomplishing. He says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of, of Abel. Amen. Uh, did you hear that? Amen. The blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. Amen. Well, wait a minute now. When you look at chapter 11, we find out about Abel's blood speaking because that's the comparison. He says in verse 4 of Hebrews 11, by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts and that through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. He says the blood of Jesus in verse 24 of chapter 12 of the new covenant 
speaks and it's better than the blood of Abel. So if it's better than the blood of Abel, what did Abel's blood say that Jesus' blood is better than? Dr. Evans will be right back after this important announcement. So the blood of Abel spoke judgment on his brother Cain. Yes. God listened to what Abel was saying in heaven and brought judgment on earth to Cain. So the blood is so powerful because Jesus' blood is better than Abel's blood. It's so powerful. Don't you know he can stop folk who messing with you? Don't you know he can overrule folks who are trying to overrule you? In fact, it's so much better than Cain's that God can even say in the courtroom to the devil, uh, you are overruled right now. Sit down and shut up. Because it is a blood that speaks. It forgives, it protects, it delivers, it empowers. That is what the blood does. The blood is not some chemical formula in the body of Jesus. It is the power of the sacrifice of Jesus operating today for believers who are operating in sync with the blood because the blood talks. Okay, let me give you another illustration. In Exodus chapter 12, it was the Passover. God was going to take the life of every firstborn Egyptian. But he told the Jews, I want you to slay an animal and shed their blood. Put the blood on the doorpost of your house. When the death angel flies over and he sees the blood, he will pass over you. In other words, what's happening to them is not going to happen to you, but I got to see the blood. In other words, I've got to see the identification of the sacrifice. If I don't see Jesus on you, I don't see the blood. And if I don't see the blood, you won't have power in the court. You see, for a lot of us, God don't see no Jesus. Therefore, he can't respect no blood because the blood refers to the sacrificial life and work of Jesus Christ. It refers to the work of the cross. To help you theologically with this a little bit deeper, in the book of Colossians, chapter one and chapter two, I just wanna read a couple of verses. In chapter one, he says in verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom. That's why I love the word kingdom. Kingdom of his beloved son. That's Jesus Christ. Now go to chapter two. He says in chapter two of the book of Colossians, when you, verse 13, were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcised in your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Having, here it is, canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, all legal language, against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he nailed the decrees of things against you, that is all the infractions against the law of God that Satan can write up. He did this, she did that, they did this, they did that. He says he canceled all the decrees, the legal accusations against you. Watch this. When did he do this? Verse 15, when he disarmed the rulers, authorities, and made public display of them having triumphed over them through him. Watch this now. The cross, the blood has canceled out 
the decrees against you. And the reason he can do this is he says he disarmed the rulers and powers that are going to come up against you. Number two, in Revelation 12, he says, first of all, that the blood was what they used to overcome him. Then they said, because of the word of their testimony. We got another legal term. What do you do in court? You testify. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, guess what he did? He quoted scriptures to the devil. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Because God likes baseball. Three strikes you out. He quoted three times and it says, and the devil left him because he's allergic to scripture. He's allergic to spiritual truth. You must give testimony to what God says in order for you to have authority in the courtroom. You won't have authority giving human testimony, human perspective, man's point of view, what Paul calls human wisdom. In uh, Numbers 13, verses 25 to 32, that whole section in there, when they were getting ready to go into the promised land, okay, they sent 12 spies in, right? 12 spies in, and the purpose for going in wasn't determined whether we're going to take the promised land. God had already told them you're going to have the promised land. The purpose of them going in was to spy out the plan for taking the promised land, not the fact of taking the promised land. So now these 12 grown men, grown men came back, you know, and Moses said, okay, what's the plan? 10 men said, we, we can't do this. We, we can't do this. Now, that's not what God said. God said, no, you're going to do this. But they went in a human opinion. And they went in a human opinion by looking at the circumstances. They said, they're giants in the land and we're like grasshoppers. Now, they called themselves grasshoppers. Okay? They gave their own self-analysis. We can't do this. There's giants in the land. Joshua and Caleb said, what y'all talking about? God has given us this land. Let's go do what God says do. That's why you don't always vote on majority opinion. You want biblical opinion, biblical truth. So two stood with God, 10 dealt with what they could see with their own physical eyes. And guess what? They cost people 40 years of their life. 40 years wandering in the wilderness, never having gotten to what was written in their book. What was written in their book was that they were going to enjoy the promised land. God had already set it up. They were going to enjoy it, but they didn't get to their book and they died in the wilderness outside of God's plan. Did you know you can die outside of God's plan? God's plan may be for you to live to be 80 and you can die at 50 if you're living outside of God's plan because you've been duped by human wisdom. God's plan may be for you been delivered from this situation by now, but you're still in it because you're operating outside of God's plan. You're operating in human wisdom and the devil is holding you up in court. The word of your testimony, you must speak in agreement with God. Do you have a public statement, word of your testimony that I, no, I don't know, God, no belief in God won't work. That, that's, that's a catch all because we don't know who you talking about. Jesus Christ clarifies the issue. There must be a willingness to be publicly identified with Jesus Christ if you want to activate the blood. Because God the Father didn't die on the cross. The Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So if you want victory over the devil, you better not be ashamed to be associated with me. You and I were on our way to certain death. We were on our way to the fire and the flames. But I know somebody with scars in his hands and scars in his feet and a scar on his side. And the only reason he's got those scars is because he was delivering you 
and delivering me. So you better not be ashamed to let people know that you belong to Jesus Christ, that he is your savior. That is the word of your testimony. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Then the third thing, he says, you'll overcome him in court by the blood, the appeal to what was accomplished on Calvary. He's lost his authority to the word of your testimony. You identify with Christ and agree to his truth. And finally, he says, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. He starts off with the cross. He goes to the confession, the testimony, and now he concludes with the commitment. He says, they lay down their lives. Now to understand this, they did not love their life even to the point of death. Is the principle of surrender. It is surrender to his will and his purpose over your will and your purpose. Even Jesus had to face this in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but thy will be done. As sweat, as blood dripped down from him as he had to approach something he didn't want to approach. He had to say, thy will be done. He had to surrender to the will of God. Here is the problem. Many of us, and maybe most, particularly in America, and let me tell you something about America. As we have left our biblical moorings, as we have left a Judeo framework, as we have left a Christian perspective, uh, that has opened the door for all hell to break loose. And that is what you and I are on the verge of now. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be serious about me, then you're going to have to deny yourself, uh, take up your cross, here it is, daily. This is the day-by-day day decision. You must take up your cross daily and follow me. So, so let me talk about take up the cross, because that takes us back to the blood, because the blood is not just a 2,000-year-old event. He says, you must take up your cross. Okay. When Jesus bore his cross and was walking down the, the road of suffering, he was being accused of being guilty of being a subversive to the Roman government. That he has been subversive to the Roman government. He is saying he is the king, not Caesar, and we are killing him for a crime. They placed on his cross, king of the Jews, because they put on the cross what you were accused of. He was accused of being a competing deity to Caesar. So that accusation was against him and they made him carry his cross to identify with the accusation against him. And he was going to have to pay the price for the identification, which was Calvary. Luke 9, 23 and many other verses like that, particularly in the book of Luke, talks about you carrying your cross, not his cross. You can't carry his cross. His cross was once and for all, for all the sins of all mankind, for all time. You can't do that, but you have a cross. What puts this cross on your back? Your identity with Jesus Christ. That's what you're going to be, you be found guilty of. You're going to be found guilty of being a Christian, okay? When you carry this cross, he says, when you get up in the morning daily, you are to say, I am willing to be identified with Christ no matter the price tag for the identification. That's what that's saying. Lay down your life daily. Well, you can't physically die daily. So he's talking about a willingness to be identified with him no matter the price tag for the identification. That, that is what it is to to, to not love your life even in the place of death. It has to do with a discipleship surrender. What a lot of people want is they want Jesus association without Jesus identification. God doesn't need no more fans. He needs some serious followers. 
He doesn't need convenient Christians, cultural Christians, political Christians, racial Christians. He needs biblical Christians who are associated with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you now, there's nothing like Jesus standing in your court and objecting to what Satan has got on you. Because I know if we tell the truth and shame the devil, he got a lot of stuff on a lot of us. That if, that, that if the judge ever hear it, we are in trouble. You better get your defense attorney up out of that chair and object over here. Because if he stays seated, because you don't want to identify with him, you in trouble. He says the cross, your identification with Christ and your discipleship the fact that you're all in. You're not just a church member, a church goer. You're not just somebody who just references Bible verses, but day by day you get up and you say, I died to me, I live for you, and that's how I roll, that's how I roll. When you do that, the text says, and they overcame him. They overcame him. They, they came out a victor and stopped being a victim. It's wreaking havoc in our world as people abandon the truth in order to pursue a lie that feels like the truth. But truth has an enemy. Truth has an enemy. We're told this in John chapter 8. Jesus says in verse 43, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. and You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, by two unchangeable things, it is impossible for God to lie. Jesus says about Satan, there is no truth in him. In Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 14. It talks about the lies of Satan. It talks about the fact that his one goal is to build a kingdom that rivals God. It says, I will be like the Most High. He wanted independence. He didn't want to have to answer to a higher authority. When God created man, he created Adam, and he created Adam and gave him the well-known instruction in Genesis 2, verse 16. But the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat it, for the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And it's a Google tree that has good information in it, bad information in it. In chapter 3, Satan shows up. He's already there, but he shows up and he begins his process of deception starting with Adam and Eve. And at the root of his deception was his opening question in Chapter 3, verse 1, half God said. Satan brings a thought to Eve's mind, a question mark. And now she begins to question because the thought is now rotating in her head. Please notice, the thought did not come from her. The thought came from the devil but was introduced to her. He introduces his thought until it becomes her thought. 
Satan's strategy is to take his thinking and make it your thinking. When he takes his thinking and makes it your thinking, it says she saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes and it could make one wise. So she eats of the fruit. Adam eats of the fruit. And they lose fellowship with God because they're removed from the garden. When this happens, their whole world collapse. So you had collapse and ultimately physical collapse because you're going to die. And like in a football game, when Adam stepped offside, the whole team of the human race was penalized. You see, when a player jumps offside, it's not just the player that's penalized. The whole team has to go back because we are in Adam and in Adam all die. He wants to break our fellowship with God through the process of deception. That's his goal. Knowing that God will separate and that he's got you now. He's got you. He's got me. And he's had us, all of us, at various levels, can testify at points in our lives, whether mentally or physically or spiritually, he got you. Now, Satan has a problem. He's got a challenge. He's not omnipresent. So he has helpers called demons. These rogue angels called demons assist Satan's goal of deception. He has assigned a demon to you who has studied you. But what he wants to do is introduce to you something that will be consistent with what he knows you're apt to respond to. These demons then create doctrines. He says there are deceitful spirits and demons that teach doctrine. But notice, it says he uses men who are seared in their conscience. So you got Satan talking to demons and demons talking to people. And the demons, the people that the demons talk to, talk to other people to teach them. To teach them. A doctrine is a teaching. He has a course. Satan has a course. The demons are trained. They find people that they can train who can speak into your life lies. They have been educated and trained as deceivers. He says, and they deceive in a number of ways. He says, they deceive by denying you things that God says is okay. You know what Satan did in the garden? He got Eve to focus on the one tree she couldn't have instead of all the other trees she could. God said, from every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But he got him focused on this tree in the middle that you can't eat. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. How many people do you know who've run away from Christianity because of all the negatives of what you can't do? So they give doctrines and they give it about things that are, are very legitimate. If you are enduring your Christian life more than you're enjoying it, you're listening to demons. If you are enduring your Christian life more than you are enjoying it, that means Satan has got you duped and tricked and looking at the wrong thing. He got you looking at one thing and not the breadth of things. 1 Timothy 6.17 says that if God gives it to you to enjoy, you should enjoy it. So Satan wants to steer you and me away from the truth so that he can control the agenda of our lives. Now he wants to draw you from the truth 
so that you don't have access to God. That's his goal. And why does he want to get you away from the truth? Let me tell you something that you need to know about you and me and, and us. Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. That's God creating life in the womb, by the way. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Number one, that verse cancels out abortion. Okay, you were aware of me when I was in the womb and what was in the womb? Me. That's personhood. Okay, that's another subject for another day. But notice what he else he said about you, about me. There's a book. There's a book. With all your ordained days. Let, let me tell you what that means. God has written out his program and purpose for your life. It's written in a book. You've got your own book with your own name on it. And that book with your name is designed to fulfill the ordained purpose of God for your life. Amen. That's your book. It's not my book. I got my book. You got your book. So what Satan wants to do is remove you from the truth so that you don't fulfill your book. So that the purposed plan of God for your book is not realized because you and I wandered from the truth. We discarded the truth partially or fully and we're duped by the deception of Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. So there's spiritual warfare among angels. It's called the angelic conflict. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives, here's our word, the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, that's where he does his business, and his angels were thrown down with him. Those are the demons. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now watch this, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, watch this, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night. Satan is called the accuser. This is a legal term. You must picture this as a courtroom. The Bible is full of court scenes. Full of court scenes. You find lawsuits. You find justice. You find judges. You find, you've, got, you've got legal uh, activity taking place in heaven, which is why we have it on earth. This is a courtroom. The prosecuting attorney is Satan. He is bringing judgment against every believer. When we sin, when we sin, he has evidence against us because we have disobeyed God, giving him material he can use in court. Why does he go to court? He goes to court for the same reason a prosecuting attorney goes to court to condemn us. 
And in order, and the purpose of condemning us is to legitimize righteous judgment against us for our betrayal of God by believing his lie, which has led us in the sin. We don't have time today, but you can see it worked out in Zechariah chapter 3, the first seven verses. Joshua was the high priest, and he's in court. He's in court, and Satan is the accuser, bringing accusation against Joshua, the high priest. And it says in that passage that his clothes had to be changed because he was dirty. So Satan had accusation against him. The accusation was true, which gave him prosecutorial rights. He did this against Job. He accused Job before God. So Satan is there in order to bring condemnation legitimately for sins we have committed or is in our propensity. Now, he is the accuser of the brethren, and since angels don't need sleep, it says it's day and night. So this is a 24-hour courtroom scene. So now, don't come out of the spiritual realm for a moment and think about court. You're in court now because this is legal. His goal in court is to bring judgment, condemnation, or keep God from intervening in your prayers, intervening in your circumstances, intervening in your ch challenges. So that's the scene, verse 11. And they overcame him. And they overcame him. Satan is the accuser, but he can be overcome concerning his, his accusations. Satan can be beaten in court. The Bible says about Jesus Christ in John chapter 2, verse 2, that if any man says he doesn't sin, uh, uh, in those first couple of verses he says he's a liar because we all sin. But it says, but we have an advocate. Remember, we're in court. The Greek word advocate means lawyer. An advocate is a lawyer. We, we say that today. Uh, talk about a lawyer being our advocate. It's a legal term because we're in God's court now. Okay? Satan does not now beat you with power. He beats you with legislation. He takes you to court. He says, I'm going to sue you. Because look at the infraction you committed. But we have an advocate. We got a defense attorney. And I like it. He says, we have an advocate with the father. And I like that. I like knowing that my advocate is the judge's son. So I got a little family thing working for me. Jesus Christ, the righteous. They overcame him. The word overcome, which is a favorite word of John, the K-O, is how it's pronounced. That word overcome is used of both a state and a standing. A state meaning a legal position and a practical ramification. So legally, we are overcomers. It's like saying, legally, I am married. Legally, you are married if you're married, okay? And that's a legal status. But we also know you can be legally married and personally miserable. So just because you have a legal status don't mean that you have a positive standing because you could be legal status but in perpetual conflict. When the defense attorney enters the room, he has the right to overcome the lawsuit that has been against you that's breaking you with fellowship God with God so that your book is not lived out in completion. But he can be beaten in court. 
And in this courtroom, there are three things that beat him. In conclusion, he says in verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ, that is his sacrificial death on the cross, is not a 2,000 year old event only. We believe in a cross, not a crucifix. A crucifix is a cross with somebody still on it. The, our Savior is no longer on the cross. The cross is a historical event with practical contemporary relevance. The Constitution was written many years ago. It's relevant today. You claim, I know my rights. You claim what was written then for what it can do now. The cross took place then, but it can get some stuff done now. When you appeal to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there's no better time to do that than communion. When you appeal to his cross, which paid the penalty for your sin, what you are saying to the accuser, that accusation has already been covered. That, that accusation, real as it is, has already right now been paid for. You are appealing to something back then for its relevancy today. The second thing that will win you in the courtroom, he says, is the word of their testimony. The word testimony is a legal term. In court, you testify. It is a legal term, meaning that you are giving judicial witness. Not based on what you see. Follow me here but based on what God says. So you literally bring to courtroom, to the courtroom, and see, some of us need to learn to have a Bible study with the devil. See, we haven't, we're, if you only have Bible studies with Christians, you ain't, you ain't using it. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and he had a Bible study with the devil? He told the devil, it is written, it is written, it is written. Now you can't have a Bible study if you don't know what's in the Bible. See, what you have to understand is Satan is allergic to Scripture. He's allergic to Scripture because he cannot handle God's Word. He can handle your Word, and he loves to hear you say, I think, and I feel, because that Word has absolutely no authority in his court. But when you bring his Word, the Word of that testimony, that is, you give testimony. When the 12 spies went in, what happened? 12 spies? Uh, 10 came back and said, we can't beat them. Caleb came back and said, yeah, yeah but God told us to go in there because we could beat them. See, majority not always right. What God says must be more important than what you see. Amen. They say, there are giants in the land. Caleb said, but what did God say? I see, but what did he say? Because that's evidence in this courtroom. It is the word of your testimony, and that testimony is the testimony of God's truth. Finally, he says, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. That means that they were fully committed, fully surrendered. They were not casual Christians, part-time saints. Jesus has a huge fan club. He's looking for some followers. He got a fan club. And every Sunday, folk gathered in the stadiums. Because they wanted...